All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. Today is Sunday, June 19th, 2022, and you are now watching Permission to Exist. I am your host, Permission to Exist, also known as PTE, and it is so good to have you all. Happy Father's Day. I think this topic is very, very well suited for Father's Day. And happy Juneteenth to those of you who celebrate Juneteenth. Great to have you in the building. Want to give a big shout out to everyone who supports the channel via... Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Wow. Okay. <laughs> via Patreon, Cash App, Super Chatting, or liking, commenting, and subscribing to the channel. I appreciate you all. Thank you all so much for your support. It means the world to me. And... Yeah. So thank you. And those are the ways that you can support if you choose to do so and if you wish to do so. So welcome, everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started. We have a lot to talk about and we have a lot to discuss. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. This. Oh, my God. I'm trying to pull it up on my phone so I can keep an eye on the comments. And I forgot the volume is all the way up. There we go. OK. So we have a lot to talk about with this particular episode. And if we have time and if I have the energy at the end of this show, I do want to do a call-in show. However, it will be calling in only for those people who adamantly disagree with what I'm saying. So that means that you really need to actually listen to the show first, and then I'll open up the lines for those who want to call in and essentially disagree or attempt to change my mind regarding this particular topic. But before you do, you're going to have to answer, how many questions do I have here? Four questions, which I will share with you towards the end of the show. And I should have made a little graphic for it so I could display those questions. And I still might. I still might do that just so they'll be on the screen, because I really don't want to have the discussion without those four questions being answered first. So that's all up in the air. It's all a possibility. Don't know for sure that I'll do it, or I might even do it on my other channel, A Deeper PTE. We'll see. We'll see what direction the night leads us in, okay? So welcome everyone to the show. Why don't we go ahead and get started? So today is Father's Day 2022, and I thought this was a perfect opportunity to discuss the topic of fathers in the home. Now, where you most often hear this topic brought up is via the Manosphere, and it's often one of their number one go-to argument points when they're debating the issue of single mothers, the issue of the deterioration of the family, the fall of society in general, but American society specifically, when we're discussing those things, one of the first things they reach for is, well, that's because there ain't no fathers in the home. They, they, you gotta, there's no fathers in the home. They're, where's the father? There's no father in the home. Or when you hear of an event similar to what happened in Uvalde, Texas, or any other event typically involving a young male who chose to act out in a violent way, the first thing that they reach for is he probably didn't have a dad or there's no father in the home. And one of my primary issues with this argument is the simplicity of it. Really, I could debunk this argument in five minutes, but we're actually going to take the long road tonight and we're going to do a long debunking of this particular argument. So they reach for it as if it is the answer and the solution to all of life's problems. Something goes wrong, no father in the home. Kids acting out in school, no father in the home. Kid ends up in jail, no father in the home. You know, kid turns out to be a terrible person. Well, he must not have had a father. So it's a simplistic argument. It's a short-sighted argument, and it's leaving out a lot of nuance. Now, I don't expect this particular group or anyone who leans on that argument to be full of nuance, which is why I'm here. We're here to add nuance and help people think in terms that are not so black and white, because I really do believe that limited thinking 
leads to a lot of the problems that we have in society. Y'all say it's because there's no fathers in the home. I say it's because so many people think in such a short-sighted way. So I'm here to help help people not think in such limited, short-sighted ways. There is a poll, and let's see where we sit so far. So, so far here at the start of the show, the question is, was your father in your life? 55% have said yes, 45% have said no, okay? So I am going to leave that poll up for a pretty long duration of the show, if not the whole show, so we can see, you know, how everyone kind of uh, shakes out on that particular issue. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Again, we often hear this discussed in the manosphere. We also often hear it discussed in conservative circles, and it's actually come up a lot lately, this problem of absentee fathers. And the Florida governor, Ron DeSantis, even recently launched a program targeted to help support fathers to help curb the problem of fatherless homes. So it, it has reached the political levels at this point. And as with other philosophies that these groups espouse, the argument is short-sighted and ridiculous as it typically, typically lays the blame at the feet of the mothers who they claim, quote, put men out of the home. There is a, I guess you could call it a meme. I don't know what you would want to call it. Um, in Black YouTube, hashtag T-B-M-O-T-H, hashtag took Black men out the home. Some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Others of you will have no clue, and that's fine. But it's a, it's a topic of discussion, and it often gets brought up in the heat of debate. But it's a limited argument, and we're going to talk about why it's limited. Ultimately, the understanding that you're supposed to walk away with when you're talking to these folks is that it's you women's fault, and women need to stop putting men out the home. Okie dokie. So I'm here tonight to debunk and destroy that argument, and we're going to do so in a couple of different ways. So the first way that we're going to do that is we're going to start off with some current events, okay? Current events. Uh-oh, my screen share stopped. One second. Let me pull it back up. Welcome to everyone in the chat. Great to have you and good to have you here. All right. Let's see if we got it now. Perfect. Perfect. So the very first current event that we're going to start off with is Mr. Herschel Walker. Herschel is some legendary football player, I guess. Of course, I know his name, but I really don't know much about his career. So you guys will have to forgive me in that respect. But I'm very, very familiar with his name. Well, apparently Herschel is making a run for a political office. And it recently came out this week that, well, this part didn't come out this week. Herschel has been known to kind of go in about the absentee father issue. And he's been known to basically make that same simple argument. Well, there's not enough fathers in the home. There's no fathers in the home. Got to get fathers in the home, right? But this week it came out that Herschel actually has, this article says two, I think the number is up to three now, three children that he fathered out of wedlock and that he also had not acknowledged publicly. So how ironic is that? He runs around crying about absentee fathers, but in many ways he's an absentee father himself, which is also often the case with this group who makes this argument all the time. They are the number one single mother creators. They are the creators of single mothers. And then they turn around and complain about the very thing that they actively, actively create you guys. So let's take a look. It says Herschel Walker acknowledges two more children that he hadn't mentioned. Mr. Walker, the Republican nominee for Senate in Georgia, oh dear, has often criticized absentee fathers but this week it has emerged that in addition to a son he often talks about, he has three other children, three. All right, and there's Mr. Walker. 
And the caption says, Herschel Walker is running against Senator Raphael Warnock, a Democrat in one of this year's most pivotal Senate races. Herschel Walker, the Republican nominee for the Senate in Georgia, has been a frequent critic of absentee fathers, especially in Black households, has acknowledged that he is the father of a second son he had not previously mentioned publicly, as well as an adult daughter who was born when he was in his early 20s. The revelation reported on Thursday by the Daily Beast is the second this week about children Mr. Walker has fathered but did not publicly disclose. The outlet reported on Tuesday about a 10-year-old son of Mr. Walker's with whom he is not in contact. That would be absentee, right? On Wednesday, Mr. Walker's campaign shared with the news outlet a form that he filled out in 2018 in order for him to be appointed to former President Donald Trump's Council on Sports, Fitness, and Nutrition. It lists the name of four children, his 22-year-old son, Christian, the 10-year-old son, a 13-year-old child, and an adult daughter. The Daily Beast withheld the names of the children and their mothers out of privacy concerns. I have four children, Mr. Walker said in a statement to the New York Times, three sons and a daughter. They're not undisclosed. They're my kids. I support them all and love them all. I've never denied my children. He added, saying I hide my children because I don't discuss them with reporters to win a campaign. That's outrageous. I can take the heat. That's politics. But leave my kids alone. The Daily Beast report on Tuesday about Mr. Walker's 10-year-old son said that the child's mother had sued Mr. Walker a year after giving birth to obtain a declaration of paternity and child support, and that the suit lasted until August 2014, when Mr. Walker was ordered to pay child support. The boy, by then more than two years old, took Mr. Walker's last name, okay? So we're not going to read the rest of that. You can look into that if you wish. It's just the irony. It's the irony for me. It's the hypocrisy for me. It's the total delusion for me. And the fact that, again, the same group that often cries and laments fatherless homes are often the creators of the fatherless homes, the creators of such. So we're going to get into that a little bit more, but I wanted to start off with that current event because it is current. That is the story, and that's why we're here today. I really want to expose the gaslighting and the illogical nature of this argument. I almost titled this the gaslighting of the fathers in the home argument, but it just didn't really flow to me. So I changed it to fathers in the home, the solution to all of life's problems. So I want to give a few disclaimers or statements, if you will, because some are going to see the title, they're going to tune in, and they're going to say PTE supports fatherless homes, PTE thinks children should grow up without their fathers, and the other simplistic, short-sighted conclusions that they'll come to without even listening to the video. So I want to state this out front. Yes, I do believe that children do the best when they are raised by two loving parents who are hopefully their biological parents. And I do think that there's something special about knowing your biological parents and being loved by them. So of course, I'm very supportive of that. That's ideal, that is the ideal. Should I ever become a mother? That's 100% what I would want for my children. I would want to be married to their father, preferably, and I would want my kids to be born in that marriage. That's what I would want. The difference between you and I is that I'm realistic and I'm also able to see who and what circumstances are at fault for these fatherless homes, okay? So that's the difference. Of course, I support children knowing their parents, being raised by their parents, two loving, mentally stable, healthy parents. I'm very much in support of that, but I also see why this problem is happening. Now, before we break it down, they're going to tell you that the problem is feminism, which is another one of their short-sighted, easy-reach arguments. 
feminism took took men out the home. <laughs> Uh, they're going to tell you it's feminism. They're going to tell you it's women wanting to be independent. They're going to blame the woman always, which is really what you're supposed to walk away understanding. Fathers aren't in the home because of the woman. That's what they want you to believe. But it's simply not true. It may be true sometimes, but it's not true always. So we're going to get into what's true. But before we do that, we have to eliminate some of the assumptions that come with this particular argument. So let's break some of those down. When you say, or when someone says, the reason that there are so many problems in today's society is because there are no fathers in the home, you're making a lot of assumptions. So let's go through some of those assumptions together really quick. The first and probably the, the biggest assumption that you're making is that all men are good men and their simple presence can, can bring a child into some sort of thriving success. That's the first assumption. All men are good men. The second assumption that you're making is that all men are good leaders because what you're basically saying is that a man is a good, all men are good men and they're by virtue of being good men, they're also good leaders. They don't realize that a lot of men, a lot of people are not very good leaders. Most people are followers. The majority of people are followers. They're not leaders by nature. So why do you assume all men are excellent leaders who can lead a family to success? Absolutely, the chat says, but they never wanna talk about why feminism was deemed as necessary or why it was necessary in the first place. Never. Don't get me started on that. That might have to be an entirely separate show. But they assume all men are good leaders. They also assume all men are good fathers. And I wanted to show you guys something. Fair use. And I really, really hope, really, really hope <laughs> that the video stays up after I show this, because I don't know how these people feel about copyright. But we're gonna take a look at something that was posted on World Star Hip Hop today, actually. And I do want to let you know that you might find it a little bit triggering, especially those of you who grew up in abusive families or abusive households. If you are not familiar with world star hip hop, I don't recommend taking taking your butt over there. Don't go over there, okay? It's the cesspool, all right? So what we're getting ready to look at, here, let me zoom out real quick. What we're gonna getting ready to look at is an example of a father in the home. He's in the home. And the title of this video is Too Far or Nah? Father Teaches His Son a Lesson for Behaving Bad at School. OK, now he's not going to strike the child, so you don't have to worry about seeing something like that. But this is what his reaction was to his child getting kicked off the school bus. OK, so let's take a look again. Just a sensitivity warning. It is a little intense and it might be triggering for some of you guys. OK, so here we go. If you're in school, right? But everybody else on the bus, right? Everybody else on the bus. I'm supposed to get out of my bed. Let you in school, right? You got me fucked up, dog. Like a real nigga. I'm so sick of you, boy. Let me show you. Let me show you, nigga. Fuck your birthday, nigga. That's how you gonna fuck me. Let's see what anybody else do for you. On your birthday, nigga. Let's see what somebody else can go spend a couple hundred dollars on you, bro. Like I do, nigga. Every year, nigga. Every year, nigga. I buy you whatever the fuck you want, don't I, nigga? Don't I, nigga? Every year, nigga. You get whatever you want, bro. Anything you add to people, I buy that shit, don't I? Anything you add to people, nigga, I buy that shit, don't I? Don't I, bro? Every time you fucking add me for something, nigga. OK, so again, the situation was 
the son got kicked off the bus. And it appears that what his father, who's in the home, decided to do was destroy, looks like a laptop that he bought him for his birthday. And he's calling him the N word. And I don't know if you caught it, but he said, I can't stand you. I'm tired of you, little N word. Okay. But he's in the home though. He's in the home. So that's what you want, right? A father in the home. So again, you're assuming all men are good fathers just because they're there. That's the assumption that you're making with your short-sighted little argument. Let's continue. You're assuming that all men are safe men. So I'd like to invoke a couple different names here. I'd like to invoke the name of Chris Watts, who was a married father in the home, who unalived both, excuse me, he unalived his wife and both of his daughters. I'm sure you all are very, very familiar with the name Chris Watts, all right? But there's some other fathers who deserve an honor, honorable mention here. You got the father of Kennedy Hoyle, who confessed to the murder of his missing two-day-old baby and the mother in Memphis. He was present, though. You got a present father here. You got this guy, who I'm sure you all remember. The guy, I did a, um, I think, did I do a show on him? I think I did, or I mentioned him somewhere in one of my shows. But the guy who unalived the mother of his child, his daughter, and he also tried to unalive his son as well. But guess what? He was in the home. He was a present father in the home. Okay. He was there. Okay. So you're making the assumption that all men are safe men and safe to be around. You're making that assumption. You are Oh, there was one more. Hold on. Let's see. I forgot to throw this one up here. Let's throw this one up here really quick. Copy and let's paste it. And let's display this one. Th these are some stand-up guys here. Boom. It says, a Florida mom was killed and dismembered by her husband and father-in-law so they could get custody of the son. So that was an active present involved father. Yeah. Yeah. So you're assuming that all men are safe men to be around. You're assuming that all men are healthy and mentally stable and, and not in need of extensive psychological counseling. You're assuming that the sudden absence of a father would automatically produce bad results in the children. Meaning if the father, let's say, is present for 10 years and then disappears for one reason or another, that suddenly the children will basically turn bad because of that. You're making that assumption. You're assuming that all biological fathers can be in the home. So people often don't think about circumstances like blended families, families where a divorce took place mom remarried and dad remarried. So now, and they had kids perhaps. So now that family is blended. I don't think the bio father can be there in another man's house trying to raise his kids. You forget about children who either came through foster care or children who were adopted. Their biological dads can't be there or won't be there, one or the other. You forget about men in the military who are gone. Now, the last time I brought this up, we were talking about this on a different show, but for the life of me, I can't remember which one it was. But they told me that men, that military tours of duty are only 180 days or something like that, which I think is six months, something like that. But I don't know if that's true. I didn't look into it because I've heard of tours of duty lasting for like 10 months, a year two years. Like I've heard of some pretty lengthy tours of duty, but does it matter? He's not there. FaceTime is FaceTime and phone calls are phone calls, but he's not physically there in the house. He's not there. He's in the military. He's gone. You forget about men who are doctors, 
who work 12 and 14 hour shifts and aren't basically aren't there. People like longshoremen who aren't there. And you also forget about fathers who have died, who have quite simply died. They're not alive anymore. Okay. Some other assumptions you're making, you're assuming that they are doing a good job and they are a positive influence if they are present. So some of you are familiar with the rapper T.I. and his son King. There was an incident at Waffle House regarding his son King recently where basically his son, who I think is like 18 years old, something like that, was arguing with one of the cooks at Waffle House and he recorded it, posted on the internet, it went viral. Well, his father, T.I., who is a degenerate in his own right, this is the same man who takes his daughter to the gynecologist to check her hymen to see if it's still intact. Do you guys remember me doing that show a couple years ago? Same guy, same one, just a stand-up character. And he also is a heavy defender of Kevin Samuels. Came and did his own little video where he basically told his son that he's not sure why his son is arguing with people who are in what he called another level of life. In other words, he was trying to say, why are you arguing with a low level, low order, what he called a short order cook? Because they have money. So what did he teach his son in that moment? He taught his son that because you have money, there's no need for you to be arguing with people who are beneath you, essentially, is what he taught his son in that moment. Not you need to control yourself in public, not that you need to control your mood, control your emotions. There's no need for you to be doing all that. You could have just gone to a different Waffle House if it was that serious. They're all over the place in Atlanta, Georgia. If it was that serious, you could have just walked out, gone to a different Waffle House. You know what I mean? But he had to prove a point in the moment. He didn't teach his son to control his ego or anything like that. He told him, basically, don't argue with the help, basically. Real stand-up guy, you know? So you assume that they are a positive influence just because they're there. Sometimes they're the absolute worst influence a child could have. Some men are alcoholics. Some men are drug addicts. Some men are abusers. Some men are molesters. Some men are gamblers. Some men are narcissists. And some men are what I call bullshitters, which means that they're not serious men. You can't take them seriously. You can't really count on them. You know, everything they say, you kind of have to take with a grain of salt. And you can't really rely on them. They're bullshitters. But they're present, though. They're right there in the house. What are some other assumptions? You assume that all fathers who don't live with their children are indeed absentee. So they neglect things like the custody arrangements where a father will get the child for the weekend or vice versa. The child might live with the father full time and then go to the mother's house for the weekend. You totally negate all of those different arrangements for fatherhood. So those are their, those assumptions. And then one of the biggest assumptions, oh yeah, scammers. Some men are scammers and shysters, as the chat says. And then another major assumption that you make is that the man is simply still alive. I think they forget that men die all the time. People die all of the time. Here's a perfect example of that. Wife of ex-Marine killed in Ukraine has seen her life completely fall apart. It says the wife of the former U.S. Marine who was killed fighting against invading, excuse me, invading Russians in Ukraine has seen her life completely fall apart since her husband's death. New York native Willie Joseph Cancel, 22, left behind his 22-year-old wife, Brittany, who's also a Marine veteran, and their seven-month-old son, Anthony, in March after he took a paid job with a private military contracting company in order to protect the innocent in Ukraine, okay? 
So here you have a married couple, husband and wife, just how you like it. They had a seven month old son. He died in the Ukraine and she became an instant single mother, instant single mother, instant, instant. Did I put that other question? Cause I just thought of one more question you'd have to answer if you're going to call in. Yep. Let me write it down. Boom. Okay. Became an instant single mom. All right. Oh, but there's more. Jeff Gladney, former TCU standout and NFL first round draft pick, dead at 25. A former TCU football standout who became a first round NFL draft pick has died. Jeff Gladney was killed in a car accident early Monday morning. His agent, Brian Overstreet, confirmed he was 25. The fatal crash happened around 2.30 a.m. in the westbound service lanes of Waddell Rogers Freeway at Allen Street. Looks like this happened in Texas. Deputies were dispatched to the accident. The Sheriff's Department received confirmation Tuesday from the Dallas County Medical Examiner's Office that the woman who was killed was a Fort Worth resident. She was 26. Early investigations indicate the white vehicle was speeding. They clipped a second vehicle from behind. Where's the part that I'm looking for? Where is it? Where is it? Ah, here we go. TCU Athletic Director Jeremiah Donati released a statement saying our TCU Athletics family and especially our football program was very devastated to learn of the passing of Jeff Gladney. After earning his degree and continuing his playing career in the NFL, he maintained close ties to TCU. He loved everything about his alma mater. He was a frequent visitor to campus and was at our spring practices and spring game this year, proudly joined by his young son. Gladney, whose son turned one years old in February, returned to Texas this week to help close on a house for his mother, okay? So he left behind a one-year-old son. All right, so right here, we have two examples, both involved, this man, Jeff Gladney was involved in his son's life. Son is one year, old, one year old. This gentleman who was a Marine died and left behind a seven month old son. So my question to you would be, what would you say to the women involved here? What would you say to her? And what would you say to his child's mother, the mother of the one year old who instantly became single mothers when these men died? So you assume that the men are even alive to be here. You assume that they're even alive to be in the house. They leave all of this out, which is why it's very important for us to talk about it and comb it out because they won't. OK, so these are all of the assumptions that you're making. Oh, and you're also assuming that the man is not incarcerated, which also happens quite frequently. Men make up the majority of the prison population. The majority is men. So you're assuming the dad isn't incarcerated from all things from white collar crime to I don't know what it's called when you do like street crime, I guess street crime from street crime to white collar crime. You have men incarcerated, many of whom have children. So what about that situation? What about that scenario? OK, so let's talk about what else this argument does not account for. And what they purposely leave out, I believe, because it, it would require too much accountability on the male's part, okay? It doesn't account for reckless male breeders like Nick Cannon, who can't possibly be in the home of all of his different children. I believe he's up to number 10 now. I think Nick Cannon has eight children already here, one of whom sadly passed away. And I think he actually has two kids on the way. And I really hate that the media chooses to promote it as if it's something to be proud of. They'll be like, Nick Cannon, ha Nick Cannon says the stork is still on the way. And then he was promoting some 
new alcoholic beverage cocktail mixture called the vasectomy cocktail, trying to make it funny. It's not funny. It's actually not funny, Nick. So Nick Cannon has eight, nine, maybe 10 children. He cannot possibly be in the home of all of those different kids. He can't. They don't like to talk about that. There was another guy who made the news recently. He's 34 years old and he has 33 children. You heard that right. He's 34 years old and he has 33 children. And I think he's a truck driver. So it sounds like everywhere he ends up, every city he ends up in, he makes a baby. But no one wants to talk about that. You know, no one wants to address that issue. He can't be in the home of 33 different kids. Well, some of the kids he has like two, two by one woman. So I think he has like 33 kids by like 20 different women. So you do the math. He can't be in all those different homes. He can't. So what about him? We don't like to account for couples that simply divorce or break up. People divorce all the time. They break up all the time. So the father may have been there in the home initially until the couple broke up. What about them? They don't like to talk about men who simply leave. The concept of running off with the secretary is a real thing that actually happens and has happened in real life. Or sometimes they run off with the babysitter, one or the other. What about the men who simply choose to leave the kids, the family, all that, or men who run off and just disappear and no one ever hears from them again. What about them? What about the men who never really wanted to be fathers in the first place? What about them? What about the children of affairs? I personally know of children who exist because their married dad had an affair and they are the byproduct of that affair. He got the mistress pregnant, got the side chick pregnant, child was born. What about them? And then finally, what about people who are quite simply mentally ill, who are just not well? They don't want to talk about that. They always just say the reason that everything is going wrong is the breakdown of the nuclear family and the lack of fathers in the home. What about the lack of mothers, though? We never talk about that either. Sometimes it's the mom that's missing in action, but we don't want to talk about that. It's the father, father in the home, missing father in the home. Okay. So now, so it's supposed to be nine months now. What do you mean? Tell me more. So let's talk some more about the illogical nature of this argument and the reason that I really could debunk it in five minutes and we could get out of here. God, what show was that? What show was that? I feel like it was on my other channel, but I just can't remember for some reason where I brought this up and I said, we'll go over it again and we'll, we'll talk about it more. Let me check really quick, see if I can jog my memory. Oh, it was. It was on a deeper PTE on a video called, this will continue to happen until we face the truth. And in that video, I was discussing what happened in Uvalde, Texas with the elementary school. And I brought it up there, but we weren't intending to talk about it there. So we didn't go in depth over there. But the problem with this argument is that it is past tense. It's past tense. When you say society is falling because there are no fathers in the home, first of all, it's not a true statement. Because by the way, and I almost posted this on the community tab, I don't know if maybe I just know good people who know good people. I don't know that that's the case, but almost every single person that I've seen get married, I would say out of 20 different marriages that I'm aware of, like from people who I went to school with and stuff, they're all still married, you guys. Like I know a girl who I went to school with She's been married for almost 20 years now. Like they got married right out of high school. So they've been married for almost 20 years. 
I'm seeing happy 13th anniversary, happy 14th anniversary, happy 17th anniversary. And I'm like, wow, did the millennials get it right? Or are the divorces forthcoming? I'm not sure which is which. I would like to remain optimistic and think that maybe the millennials got it right. I don't know. Or maybe I just grew up in the South and that's what Southerners do. I don't know. But I'm seeing a lot of long-term marriages with fathers in the home. Okay. So it's not true, number one, but for, for the circumstances in which it is true, it's already happened. It's not like fatherless homes just happened, you guys. This has been going on for decades. So they're arguing about something that has actually already taken place. And you cannot go back to the start of a child's life and put the father back. Do you see what I'm saying? So to me, it's a way to duck and dodge the reality that we're dealing with, which is a lot of people grew up without fathers and a lot of people grew up with their fathers. But it's such a short-sighted, simplistic argument because you can't go backwards. You can't go back in time and put the father in the child's life. Truly, you really only have about 18 years to make a difference. So once those 18 years have passed, now what do you do? Chat says, most people I've seen divorce. So interesting. That is interesting. What do you do now? It's already taken place. It already happened. And on top of that, it has compounded generationally. So this one grew up without a father. They grew up, they made kids. Those kids grew up without a father. They grew up, they made kids. Those kids grew up without a father. We're three and four generations in, in some circumstances. So you can't go backwards in time. That's part of what irritates me so much so much about this argument. It's like, you can't, you can't hit reset. You see what I mean? So when you say, you know, there's no fathers in the home, well, which group are you talking to? Are you talking to generation Z? Are you talking to the millennials? Are you talking to gen X? Like who is your target market here? Because we're already many generations in honey. It's already too late is what I'm trying to say in many different circumstances. So who exactly is your target audience? Young men and young women, like people who haven't had kids yet. Are you only talking to single mothers and not, not the fathers who made them single mothers? Like who, who is your target audience? It's already happened. You're crying over spilled milk, basically. If you were going to get upset about this, you should have gotten upset about this probably like anywhere between 50 to like 70 years ago is when you should have started ringing the alarm on this issue. But you didn't. So now that the end result is starting to come into fruition, now they're harping about it as if there's something you can do about it. A lot of the people you're talking about, the kids you're talking about, have already grown up. They're already adults. And a lot of them have actually gone on and turned around to make single mothers out of people, to make single parent households. So who, who exactly are you talking to? They're not talking to anyone. It's a, it's a dumb argument. It's silly because truly... Your audience should be young people between the ages of like 16 and 21. That should be who you're talking to because everyone else has already grown up. So there's that issue with the argument. Then you have the issue of them rarely holding accountable. The one who this whole conversation is about, which is the man. Are women sometimes occasionally responsible for the breakdown of a family? Yes, occasionally it does happen, but quite often that is not the case. You're not holding the one who left accountable. You're not asking him, you're not asking him, why did he leave? Why did you abandon your family? Why did you abandon your children? Why? They're not asking them the question. They just completely ignore what he did because of course men don't do anything wrong. And they focus entirely on the woman. It's got to be her fault, right? 
So they rarely hold accountable the one who this whole conversation is about, the man who left. Then you have this issue, which they also don't talk about. The issue that you cannot force a man to be there if he doesn't want to be. If a man does not want to be in that house, he won't be, and you can't make him. There are no laws forcing that man to be in the home. There just aren't. There aren't any laws on the books that would force him to be there. The only laws really are like the child support laws and things of that nature, but you got to find him first. You have to find him and you're assuming he's able to be found. So you can't force him to be there. I think that might be more important than even I'm giving it credit for. Everyone's crying about no man in the house, no man or fathers in the home, but you can't force him to be there. They really act like there's a bunch of men sitting around like in hotel rooms or apartments who desperately want to get back home to their family, but there's something preventing him from going. Usually when something is preventing him from going, it's like a restraining order. But other than that, typically they don't want to be there. And I'll tell you why I think that is, you guys. And this is kind of deviating from the topic a little bit. But I think a lot of men, whether they realize it or not, don't exactly enjoy family life, which is very loud. Family life is very messy. Family life can be kind of annoying sometimes, not always, but kid, kids can be kind of annoying. They're loud. They need to be watched all the time. They need to be entertained, fed, kept alive, driven to school, driven to all their different practices and things like that. You got to teach them. You got to train them. You got to nurture them. You have to basically give them a lot of attention. And I think men often go from a life of complete solitude, living in their apartment or their home by themselves, doing whatever it is men do alone. God only knows, right? To a life that becomes very, very loud and chaotic and reckless, and not reckless, but basically there's a lot of activity all of a sudden. It goes from very, very peaceful to high activity. And even if he wasn't alone, let's say he and his wife or he and his long-term girlfriend were living together and they had a relatively peaceful life, then you bring the kids in. Basically what I'm saying is a lot of men can't deal with being aggravated is what I'm basically saying. They're, they cannot deal with the aggravation that is family life. They can't deal with it. So they leave. They don't know they don't know how to give up their peace, basically, which is what you're going to give up a lot of times. If you have a bunch of children, oftentimes you're going to give up your peace temporarily until they leave the house. But then they typically leave and come back with grandchildren who turn around and do the same thing. So they're, they're not ready for that. Nobody tells them that. Nobody tells them that once you have one, two, three, four children, your peace is gone. So he may be used to sleeping in on a Saturday. Well, now he's up at 6 a.m. because the kids are jumping on the bed. You see what I mean? And they don't know how to cope with that. So they just leave. When you should have seen that coming, honey, somebody should have told you that. I think the men who do well in those situations are men who come from large families themselves. So they're already used to all the noise. They're already used to all of the chaos that comes with a large family. They're accustomed to it already. But bless you, a lot of other men are not accustomed to that lifestyle. And it's such a dramatic shift that they just leave. They do. Bless you, honey. <laughs> well, bless you. You okay? They just leave because they don't know how to deal with it. And they leave the woman with all that stress or they're not accustomed to the woman responding to all that stress. It's stressful. That's why people need help with children. That's why they always need so much help. Raising kids is a very stressful activity. <laughs> the chat says, so glad you speak about men finding their children annoying. A lot of them do. 
They like them when they're babies and very easy to manage and very easy to control. But once they're no longer babies and they hit that toddler stage, that's it. He's he's lost interest. Because it's kids can be annoying. It's just a fact. All right. So you can't force him to be there if he doesn't want to be. So how do you how do you solve that problem when you can't force force a man to be there if he doesn't want to be? And then finally, and this is borrowing from the work world. The the argument itself is illogical because presence does not equal productivity. Meaning, just like at work, you know how right now they're desperate to get everyone back in the office, you know, face to face. And the people who've been doing remote work are pushing back. Well, part of the reason is because just because someone is in your office does not mean they're working, even if the boss is there. Unless you have some solid output that would determine whether or not you went to work today, most people are at work playing, honey. They're on Amazon. They're shopping. It's called fake work. They're at their computer. They're typing away. But do you really know what they're doing? Probably not in most circumstances. They're talking to their friends. They're chit-chatting. They're texting. They're ordering things. They're handling business. And that, that's not everyone. But the reality is our economy has become such to where really most people only really need to work 20 hours a week to get the job done. But you demand 40. So they show up for 40. And the other 20 hours, they're basically goofing off. So just because they're there doesn't mean they're actually working. Same thing with this particular circumstance. Presence does not equal productivity, meaning just because someone's there doesn't mean they're productive. It doesn't mean that they're present. I know lots of fathers who all they do when they get home is they go into their man cave and they watch TV all night long, all night long. That's it. Yes, he's there. Yes, he's in the house. But is he really participating? Is he helping? Is he doing anything truly to contribute to the growth of the family other than bringing in money, which, yes, is very important. Families need money to survive. But is that it? Is money all that's being brought in? Are you giving the kids time, attention, energy, interest? Do you listen when they speak? Are, do you care at all about what they're going through in their, in their life? Or does the man come home, go into his man cave and watch TV all night long? His filthy little man cave on top of that. Those man caves typically have candy wrappers everywhere, cans and bottles everywhere, trash, randomized trash, old food plates that have been eaten off of. Don't get me started. Please don't get me started on that. So just because he's there, does that mean he's actually contributing in an active way, in a meaningful way that would really help the family out? Or is he mentally and emotionally checked out? But he's there though, okay? Chat says, I remember I used to tell my ex-spouse he was just like a piece of furniture. There's lots of people living like that, you guys. They are married, they have children, they go home every single night and they go home and they sit and watch TV all night long or they play on the computer all night long. One or the other. Meanwhile, the mom is the one up running around, chasing after the kids, doing laundry, cooking food, checking homework, taking people to soccer practice, bringing them back, getting them ready for prom, bringing them back. And sure, dad will hand over his credit card so they can buy the prom dress or the tuxedo or whatever, but that's the extent of it. Do you understand? So how, how is that helpful? What's being mentored? What's being taught? What's What experience and wisdom is being passed down? Do you see what I mean? When he comes home and literally watches TV all night long, TV destroyed. You wanna talk about what destroyed the nuclear family? Television destroyed the nuclear family. Then the internet came along and wiped it out. 
but that's a different conversation for a different day. But the fact that you can come home and just sit and stare at a TV all night, it's one thing to come sit and stare for an hour and watch your favorite show. You get caught up on your favorite show. That's fine. But I'm talking, y'all, I literally mean all night long. I literally mean falling asleep in front of the TV. That's what I mean. So <laughs> chat says, I knew he was asleep when he dropped the remote. You see what I mean? Like, where, where's the, where's the family structure in that? Where's the family in that? You see what I mean? Not even taking one day off to say, you know what? Tonight, I'm not going to watch TV all night long. Tonight, I'm going to hang out with my kids. Tonight, me and my kids are going to do stuff together. You know what I mean? Nope. I'm talking, boy, if I could tell you what I know, ho -ho, I know what I know. I know what I know. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. Lots of men go home every night and they are in the house. Lots of fathers in the home, but all they're doing is sitting there and watching TV all night. That's it. That's literally it. Okay. So presence does not equal productivity and it doesn't equal a healthy family just because you're there. I mean, it's nice. It looks great for pictures and things like that. The neighbors can see him coming home every night. Like, wow, what an involved father. He comes home every night. Just because he's home, honey, doesn't mean he's home. He's home, but he's mentally checked out. So present, presence does not equal productivity. So those are all the reasons that this argument is very, very illogical. The issue itself has already happened. The absentee father has already happened. They don't hold the men accountable for, for leaving often or abandoning the family. You cannot force a man, you can't force anyone to be somewhere they don't want to be. But in particular, you cannot force a man to be somewhere he does not want to be. And presence doesn't equal productivity. Okay. So chat says men talk about being the head or leading, but do the bare minimum or nothing to earn that title. Absolutely. Like leading is very active. It's an active thing. It's an, it's an active, involved thing. Just because you come home and sit in the living room or in your man cave all night does not mean you're leading the family. What are you leading? Like, kids can tell when you're not interested in them. <laughs> kids can tell. You know what I mean? They can tell. And this would be a separate show, but... There are lots of girls who actually grew up with their dads, but their dads weren't interested in them. They really weren't. So sure, their dad was there. They know their dad. Their dad might even be married to their mom, but the dad really took no interest in her life at all. And same for sons. The same is true for sons as well. But I bring up women because basically a girl can have an absentee father experience in the presence of her actual biological dad. I call them functional orphans. They are functional orphans, meaning they're not real orphans, meaning they don't have either parent. They are functional orphans in that they have their parents, but their parents are so disinterested in their life and so uninvolved that they might as well be orphans. That's what I mean by functional orphan. There's lots of functional orphans out here. That's why the whole father in the home argument is ridiculous because you leave out the functional orphans. Chat says, so true, PTE. My children's father was in the home, but always in his man cave or would leave to hang out with his friends. Exactly. Like, it's, it's so prominent to me that when I see an actual engaged, active father, it looks strange to me. I'm like, wow, he is really involved in his kid's life, meaning they're always together. They're always doing stuff, different things too, going here, going there, trying this out, trying that out. They hang out with each other. They have inside jokes. They, they seem to like each other, the kids and their dad. You know, he he's the one taking them everywhere. Like when a dad is involved, you would almost think they don't have a mom when a father is truly involved. And a friend of mine said, and I meant to look this up and I just never had an opportunity to, according to what she told me, 
And the reason I, I'm not familiar with it is because it's actually the first time that I ever heard it. But according to her, she said that the Bible says a man is actually supposed to raise the kids, meaning essentially once the woman gives birth, she's supposed to hand the kids off, not in an absentee way, but she's supposed to basically turn the baby over to the man and say, have fun raising it, basically. And she supports and she's a supportive role, but the dad is supposed to raise the kids. Now, I need to ask her again where she got that from in the Bible, because she did give me, she told me the verse. I just can't remember what it was and I didn't write it down, but it really has had me thinking ever since she told me that. And in a way, it almost makes sense. It's like, look, I've done the hardest part. I grew the baby in my body and I gave birth to it. You raise it. <laughs> you raise it. And apparently that's supposed to be the order. Now I have to, I need to verify that. So don't quote me, but I thought it was really interesting. And it actually also made a lot of sense to me. Like it makes sense. Like the mom has done the hard work. You raise the baby, you guide it, you lead it, you teach it, you, you take it outside and play with it. You go swimming. Like you, you you do all those things. I'll be here. I'll cook some dinner. I'll keep the house clean. You raise them. Like, it does make sense, doesn't it? The chat says birth is traumatizing, so that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense to me. I need to ask her where she got that from. But that's what she said. She said, according to the Bible, the man is actually supposed to be the one leading, raising, and teaching the kids. He's supposed to be the active one. And you're supposed to kind of be on standby, kind of overseeing the whole thing because you've kind of done the hardest part. OK, <laughs> makes a lot of sense to me. So when I see these men who are super involved with their children, it's so bizarre to me that it's it, it stands out. It stands out. I'm like, wow, he is really, really, really involved. And if I know him or speak to him or whatever, I'm like, you are really, really good with your kids. They're so lucky to have you. You're a really, really, really great dad. Like they're the ones carrying the baby bag. They're the ones pushing the stroller, carrying the baby, taking the baby up. Da, da, da. The one thing they might not do is change diapers, but the ones I've seen will even do that. They'll change the diaper and everything. They give them baths. They change the diaper. They feed them. They get their snacks together. They, you know what I mean? They're super involved. And according to my friend, that's the way that it's supposed to be. And the mom is like a support She's like a wingman in a way, you know? So I'm like, you raise it. This is your baby, you raise it, you know? But anyway, that's another, another discussion for a different day. But I just thought that was so interesting because I'd never actually heard that before. But she said that that's in the Bible. So I need to talk to her and figure out where she got that from. All right. So what can be done at this point? What can actually be done? Ah, chat says Galatians 5.16 says something about fathers raising their children in the Lord, but that refers to Bible training. I wonder if that's what she was talking about. I do wonder. So I have to look into that because I thought that was very, very interesting because you never hear that. You never hear that ever. You never hear that come out of this crew. Like the fathers are actually supposed to be the one raising the children anyway. It's not even really supposed to be the mom raising the children. It's supposed, it's supposed to be the dad raising the kids. You never hear them say that ever, 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 ever. Do you hear them say that? So, and I'm sure they, they casually and quietly leave that out of the discussion. All right. So there's that. So what can be done at this point? What can be done? Because that's kind of where I'm at with it. The fatherless if a child is fatherless, it has already happened. So what can we do now at this point, at this stage in the game to correct the problem if, if the problem can be corrected? I have a couple of ideas, so I'll bounce them off of you guys. First, what, what is actually needed is not just the physical presence of a human body in the male form. More is needed than that. What we need are loving loyal, family-oriented men 
who are also compassionate and wise. See, they don't ever get into the actual characteristics because in their mind, maleness is what makes the family good or makes the family whole. Just the simple fact or the simple presence of a male should be what makes the family okay. And that is not the case. You need men of character, loving, loyal, compassionate, wise, family-oriented men. That's what's actually needed, not just a male, okay? But what else do we need and what else can be done? For the children who are currently adults, who grew up without a father, there's nothing that can be done about them. It already happened. They already went through their childhood without their dad. They're adults now. There's nothing that can be done. Occasionally, you'll hear stories of children reconnecting with their fathers later on in life. And I think that's beautiful. But it's not what these people are talking about. They're talking about fathers in the home, which to me indicates we're talking about people 18 years old and younger. So what about all the other generations that have already passed by without their dad? There's nothing we can do. So that's what I call spilled milk. You're crying over spilled milk. All we can do is hope that that generation doesn't repeat the same cycle, which is often the case. They often do repeat the same cycle. They go one or two ways. They either become the most amazing parents and fathers because of what they went through and they're determined not to let their children experience the same thing that they did, or they turn around and repeat the same cycle. And that could just be genetic, different conversation, different channel. That could just be genetic. But all we can do with that generation or those generations is hope that the same cycle is not repeated, but there's nothing you can do. They're already grown and gone. So we're, we're focusing on Gen Z now at this point, I assume, and, and the rest of the millennials, I assume. So there's that. What else can we do? Well, for young men, we could normalize and market fatherhood as a good thing, just like you normalized whoremongering. I love how the same society that promotes promiscuity, whoremongering, you know, sleeping around, we don't love them hoes. The same society that prom has promoted that for years now is now complaining that there are so many fatherless homes. But look what you promote as a society. Look what you promote. Kind of to detour, but on a similar example, everyone is having the gun control conversation right now. And obviously both sides of the argument are raging about it. Well, why don't you start with your media? Why don't we remove all the movies that have gunplay in them? Tell Hollywood, we no longer want your movies that display violence and normalize violence and guns. We don't want that anymore. We could start there. But <laughs> you see what I mean? But like the damage is done. You promoted it for years, decades, 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 violence, violence, violence for decades. Now you have a violent society and you're surprised. Why are you surprised? Chat says, deadbeat dads need to be shunned by other men. Absolutely. It's funny you say that. It's one of my points. So how do you normalize and promote something for years, for decades on decades on decades, then act surprised at the end result? Like, that's crazy. So what you need to market and normalize is fatherhood as a good thing, not a bad thing. Like, in the Black community in particular, you know, it's heavily marketed that, you know, if you get a girl pregnant, the first instinct should be, well, that ain't, it ain't my baby. Ain't my baby. You sure? You sure it's my baby? The first instinct is to run versus run towards her, run towards the baby. The instinct is to run away. That's what's been taught, promoted, and heavily marketed. But what bothers me more than that is the rapid uptake of that. Just because somebody marketed that to you doesn't mean you had to accept it and go with it. But just because they they normalize that for you, you don't have enough instinct to say, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. That doesn't seem to be working. But don't get me started. Don't, don't get me started on that. But anyway, 
as a culture though, as a, as a whole society, we've normalized whoremongering and promiscuity in our media, in our music, and now we're acting surprised by the end result. We're acting surprised by the outcome. This is the outcome. We planted those seeds for years. Now your seeds are blooming and blossoming and you don't like it, do you? You don't like it. Well, normalize and market fatherhood as a good thing, as a positive thing. Something else that you can normalize and market is quite simply being single. Good God almighty. Good Lord like this culture has everyone believing that if you're not attached to another human being, something's wrong with you, your life is going to be miserable, that there's nothing else in this world for you to do than get hooked up with someone else. You do not have to be with someone else, honey. You really don't. You don't. When you find someone else to be with, is that a beautiful thing and a good thing? Yes, I think it's wonderful when you find yourself in a loving relationship, but you should not let the pursuit of that ruin your life because the pursuit of relationship has ruined a lot of people's lives. Different show, but it's true. Just this belief that you have to be dating. Like I cannot stand it when <laughs> I, I'll either see something on YouTube or really it's YouTube because I don't watch TV anymore, TV anymore but Someone will be like, yeah, I just got out of a 10 year relationship. You know, I just finished up school or, you know, basically they describe this crazy life circumstance that they just got out of. And they're like, so I'm ready to date and I'm ready to get out there and meet somebody. It's like, why? <laughs> like, why don't you just chill? Can you chill? Like, can you chill? Just chill. You just got out of a 10-year relationship. They broke your heart. They did this. They did that. You just moved across country. Now you're ready to get out there and start dating and mingling. Like, chill. Relax. Like, <laughs> relax. Your pursuit of being attached to another human being has ruined a lot of your lives. It really, really, really has. You don't have to download Tinder. You don't have to download Plenty of Fish. You don't have to download Bumble. You don't have to do these things. You really don't, honey. You really, really, really don't. Like, I want to be the first one to tell you that, that you don't have to. You can simply exist. You can live life. You can find things, other things to do to, to find fulfillment. And I promise you, when you take that approach, the right person will more than likely just come into your life. They'll just appear. They will appear. How many people have you heard say, I wasn't even looking, wasn't even trying to date anybody. I wasn't even trying to get married. You know, I was just doing my thing and I met this person. How many times have you heard that? Like we could normalize that. Just be, just exist, honey. Be single. Live, keep yourself alive. Figure out what your life is about. We could normalize that too. But instead our culture pushes relationship primarily for marketing and money-making purposes. And a lot of people have destroyed their lives behind relationships. They really have. <laughs> Chat says, whew, people still using plenty of fish. I think they are. I think they are. I can't do dating apps, y'all. They make me too depressed because they really give me a snapshot of the current state of society in general, but the current state of the dating market. And I just can't. I'm like, oh my God, who raised you guys? What is it? When you swipe right or left? No, when you swipe right, you want to meet them. When you swipe left, you're getting rid of them. After, after about a hundred swipes to the left, I usually just take the app off my phone. I haven't had that app for years because it's just too depressing. It's like, good God, who raised you? <laughs> who raised you guys? Who raised you? I can't do it. It's just so, just seeing how people live, honey, and 
I can't. Let's let's not get into it. Let's not talk about it, okay? We'll talk about it another day because it it depresses me like nothing else. I'm like, this is what's out here? You kidding? I'm convinced and I have a theory that all of the high quality people are actually at home. And I mean that with all my heart and soul, honey. I really do. Like if I were to get married, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Actually, let me see if we can get some more votes. We have 90 votes. Let's see if we can get 100 votes. And the question was, was your father in your life? 58% said yes, 42% said no, okay? So I'll see if we can get 100 votes and then I'll end the poll, all right? But um, I believe like if I am to get married, my husband is home, honey. He's home right now. He's not on any dating app. He's home doing whatever. God only knows. But he's home. Like I really believe the highest quality people just go home every day. They're not out in the streets. They come out occasionally maybe to celebrate a friend's birthday or a friend's achievement or something. But other than that, they go home. And that's why you can't find them. And that's why you can't meet them because they're home. <laughs> I really, really believe that. I believe that with all my heart and soul. I really do. But anyway, um, what else can we do? We can encourage men. Oh, wait, wait. Before we get there, we can make it easier to buy homes that you want these fathers to be in. Okay. Y'all know how I feel about homes, home ownership, landlords, rent, all of that. You know how I feel about that already. If you don't, check out my other channel, Pettynomics. It's here on YouTube. So you already know how I feel about that. So I won't go off on that tangent. But what I will say is make it easier to buy the homes that you want these men to be in so badly. Because I truly believe if home ownership was more accessible, in particular to men, that they would probably be more prone to like get married and start families. They already have a house. So it's kind of like, you know, in nature, there are some birds who make their nests all elaborate and they go like pluck a flower from here and a little twig from over there and they put it in there and then they do their little mating dance at the front of their nest. Like, yeah, baby, look what I got. You see this nest? Yeah, you like that, don't you? I got all, you see these feathers, girl? You see all these feathers, girl? I'm here for you. Don't you want to live in here with me? Like, imagine how different it would be if young men, well, men in particular, people, but we're talking about men tonight, could purchase a home, a decent home in a decent neighborhood, get out there on the dating market and be like, yeah, I already have a house. I'm, I already have a house. You know what I mean? I could marry you. I could put you in my house. And if you have a baby, we already have somewhere to live. You see what I'm saying? Like, versus I have an apartment, which trust me, I'm not knocking apartments. I lived in apartments for years, not by choice. I wanted to live in a house, but don't get me started. Don't you let me slip off that slippery slope. Don't do it. But I'm not knocking apartment life, apartment living. You have to live somewhere, right? But what I'm saying is versus, yeah, come date me and let's go back to my apartment, now, let's go back to my house so I can show you where I live and how I live. So you'll be more interested in forming like a long term relationship with me. I think they would propose more because they would feel more like men because they would be doing the number one thing that men are supposed to do, which is provide. So if you already have the home and you already have provision for that woman, it makes starting a family that much easier versus bouncing from apartment to apartment to apartment. Okay, so there's that, which leads into my next point, which is encourage men to marry young. Now, I'm guilty of encouraging the opposite, but not for whoremongering reasons. What I used to tell people was, and I still believe this to some extent, however, seeing what becomes of men, not all men, but seeing what becomes of a lot of men who stay single for too long, I think I've changed my opinion. So my old opinion was, you need to live life a little bit and figure out who you are. And you need to live alone for a little while so you really know who you are. Because 
a lot of times people discover who they are with other people. And I think that's why they break up because you didn't know that he likes to leave the AC off and you need the AC set at 70 degrees. That's something you only discover really when you live alone. Just a simple example, but it's an example nonetheless. Or here's another one. You didn't know maybe that he's a neat freak and she's really, really, really messy or vice versa. She's a neat freak and he's really, really, really messy. These are things that you need to discover that on your own. That's what I used to believe. But now I'm starting to believe we need to encourage men to marry young and marry fast. Because when they don't, they typically turn into insufferable incels, insufferable, miserable incels when they haven't married someone by like age 30, maybe 35 at the latest. They turn into insufferable, miserable incels. So I think I've changed my position. We need to encourage them to marry young. Marry your high school sweetheart. Marry your college sweetheart. Marry her. Why not? You know what I mean? I can't tell you how many men, when I was younger, like in my early 20s, would say, I'm not ready for a relationship right now. How many of you have heard that before? I'm not ready for a relationship right now. When they're like 19, 20, 21, 22, I'm not ready for a relationship right now. And they may not actually be ready, but baby, if you let it go on too long, they turn into like the worst of the worst. So I don't know. I think that's up for discussion, but I think we should encourage them to marry their high school sweetheart, marry your college sweetheart, marry her. Like, cause it's probably not going to get much better for you, honey. They say that we're hypergamous. Men are hypergamous. Meaning they claim that women are always looking to, to keep going up. So even if they get married, they're going to marry the next richest guy as, as if love doesn't exist. Okay. as if women don't feel love or become very attached to one man or, <clears throat> you know what I mean? You know, of course we don't feel love. We don't have emotions or anything like that. So they think that when the next richest guy comes along, she'll just hop off this one and go on to the next one. That's you guys. Y'all are always trying to marry the next finest female. Like, dang, my girl is kind of attractive, but what if I can get a prettier girl? Oh, got the prettier girl. Wow, what if I can get a prettier girl? Like, just stop. You're not going to get that much prettier, okay? In terms of women, just marry the one you got. Marry her, especially if she likes you. Like, that's the rare part, having someone actually like you for you. If you meet someone who likes you for you, mar marry her, honey, because you're only going to get worse with time. Okay? So there's that. Now, what else can we do? We could incentivize marriage and family, even though it already is incentivized to some extent in the form of tax breaks and tax relief. Like I'm trying to get married just to get some break on these taxes, honey. Who wants to marry for these taxes? I won't bother you. As a matter of fact, I would much prefer you live in your own house. But um, <laughs> only half joking, but we could incentivize marriage and family I don't know if this is a fact, but I feel like I picked this up somewhere. In other countries, countries that we think we're better than, you know, we think we're so first world and other current countries are second and third world. But it's my understanding in other countries, they give like newly married couples like money. $10,000, $20,000. Again, I don't know how true that is or if, where I picked that up from. But they basically are trying to do just that. They're trying to incentivize marriage. So why not get $20,000 from the federal government when you get married? I bet people will be getting married left and right. Incentivize it. Incentivize marriage. Incentivize family. Make it profitable. Make it a profitable endeavor for people to engage in. You see what I mean? We can incentivize it. Now, going back to what someone else said earlier in the chat, we could shame and silence the voices that encourage men to be uncontrolled, reckless breeders. Voices like Kevin Samuels. Oh, wait, he got silenced recently. But there are still too many of them who basically tell men, like Kevin used to tell men or tell women 
if you marry a rich man, you cannot expect him to be faithful. But then on the other hand, he would turn around and tell people, you know, we need families. We need the family. We need the family to come back together. You know, the family has fallen apart. Okay, so which is it? Because men who cheat all the time do not have strong, stable, solid families. He's a liability. Do you understand? He's a liability. That's like having a football team where one of your players is always doing something that kind of benefits the other team low key. So they purposely miss a tackle. They purposely don't catch the ball. They almost scored a touchdown, but uh, they let themselves be tackled right before they cross the finish line. Why would you keep that person on the team? They're a liability. They're a liability, you know, or you're, you're in business with somebody. Then you find out that your business partner is always giving trade secrets to the competition. They're calling up your number one competitor, giving them little secrets and stuff. They're a liability to your business. It's the same thing. Rich or not, if you're always out here running around with other people, other women, that's a liability to the family. But he would tell women, well, if you got a rich man, you got to expect a rich man going to cheat. Okay, well, that's not building a family, Kevin. Oh, wait, sorry, he can't hear me. To those who believed in what he used to say, that's not building a family. Yeah, he's been silenced forever. That's not building a family. How do you think the children would feel about that? The children of cheaters, hmm, different show. Wow, mm, that's a different show. The children of cheaters, because that child is always going to be looking at their father like, why you do my mama like that? Why do you treat my mother like that? And then if you want to double that up, if he makes a baby outside of the marriage and now they have a half sibling to deal with, don't get me started, you guys. It wrecks families. It wrecks them. And then you could take it even a step further. When he dies, you think though, if he's rich, when he dies, you think your half siblings aren't going to come for some of the inheritance? So now your children with your wife have to split money with your side chick's children. Y'all, please, let's not, let's not. Okay? The children of cheaters are not happy children. They're not. And they know. They always know because you're also typically very sloppy and messy. Okay? So there's that. And they also don't ever, the girls at least, don't learn how to pick good men if their daddy is a low-life cheater. They don't know how to pick good men because, like, what do you make of that? Okay, my parents were married. I had a father in the home, but he cheated on my mom all the time. What do you make of that? So anyway, continuing on, we're still talking about what can actually be done at this point. So if men feel so strongly about fathers in the home, why don't they adopt some of these young people, but specifically young boys? Why don't you adopt them and take them into your house? And you become their daddy. What about that? It's an option. You could approach that single mother and say, listen, I strongly, strongly believe that fathers should be in the home. And I see you're a single mom and you're struggling. So I'd like to adopt your son. I've adopted three other boys. I have finances, resources, and means, and I'm raising them as my sons because I believe that strongly in fathers in the home. So may I adopt your child and take that burden off of you? Why don't you do that? It's an option. It's an option. Most of them would scoff at that though. They would scoff at that idea. Adopt them. Or like if you have a sister or something like that, and she's a single mom and you just hate the fact that the child's dad is not there, why don't you adopt your nephew or niece? Adopt them. Adopt them. You could do that and become the father in the home. Similarly, we could roll out more mentorship programs that kind of do that, just not in a legal adoptive sense where a man kind of takes on... Um, I was going to say understudy, but that's not really what I mean. Basically, he's he's he chooses to oversee the life of that young child. Like, look, I know the kid's father is not present, not around. I'm available. I have resources and I have means. I will mentor this child into adulthood. 
probably pretty creepy if you approach a stranger that way. But I'm talking about men who are kind of networked in the community, men who aren't <laughs> creeps. You know what I mean? Like solid men. Why don't you just kind of mentor a kid? Just say, you know what? This kid don't have nobody. So I'll, I'll stand over you. I'll protect you. I'll mentor you. I'll be your stand-in father until you reach adulthood and even beyond then. You know what I mean? Why not do that? Or is that asking too much? All right. So there's that. We could always teach men how to actually control their sexuality and whom they get pregnant. Like if I had a son, the number one thing that I would need him to understand is that nobody gets pregnant without your permission, period. No girl can carry your seed without your permission. So you have to be the one to control that. Look at it like lollipops. If you have a handful of lollipops and there's people all around you, no one is going to have one of your lollipops unless you hand it to them. That's how we'll start when he's old enough to kind of start understanding things. Son, if you have a handful of lollipops, handful of... <laughs> Son, if you have a handful of lollipops and there's... 10 people standing around you, 10 little girls are standing around you, how would they get your lollipops? Well, if I give, give them a lollipop, mommy. Exactly. Good boy, run along and play. Then as he gets older, we'll graduate that conversation. But what I need him to understand is ultimately he's in control of what he gives away. You're in control of that. So no one gets your lollipops unless you hand it to them. You get that? Now, once you hand it to them, she can do whatever she wants to with that lollipop. She can eat it. She can throw it on the ground. She can throw it in the trash. She can hold on to it and eat it later. She can do whatever she wants to once you give it to her. But you have to give it to her first. Do you understand how much power you have in this equation? You have the most power before you hand over your lollipop. Do you get that, son? Wonderful. Now run along and play. No one gets pregnant without your permission. We could teach them that. We could teach them how to control their sexuality and whom they get pregnant. And then finally, we could teach men how to love in general, but also how to love women and children. This current culture that we have is so dangerous for so many different reasons, but one thing that this culture is the most guilty of, this manosphere, ideology, culture that is spread like a really sick virus throughout our society, is that it is deprogramming men toward love. It is teaching men how to hate, basically, and it is stripping them of their empathy, and it is stripping them of their compassion and it is stripping them of their tenderness. Men do have tenderness. It's stripping them of all of that and teaching them to be these empty robotic vessels that only know how to eat, sleep, and have sex. And that's it. it oh, perfect. Chat says stripping them of their humanity. It is stripping them of their humanity. It is teaching them that if you like a woman or you find yourself attracted to a woman, don't even bother, bro. She just probably is sleeping with some Chad or some Tyrone and she's just going to use you and take all your money. It's like, what? You know, or they call them simps if they like a woman or simp if you help out, help a woman. Like they are teaching them how to hate absolutely 100% stripping them of their humanity so we have to find a way to reinstill that in, in young men. I think the old men are finished. They're done. They're for the streets. There's no hope for them because anyone who would readily latch on to something like that, you, something has been wrong with you for a long time. Like if somebody can actually deprogram you and then reprogram you to be an empty, soulless bot, something was already wrong with you to begin with. You're for the streets. 
But the young men, before they turn, because it's almost like they turn, you guys. It's almost like, no offense to pit bulls or pit bull owners, but it's very similar to when pits do turn. Because that's the problem with pits, unfortunately. Not all of them. I know a lot of pits go their whole life. They never heard a fly. And a lot of pits are scared of flies, okay? Like a fly comes in the house, the pit runs and hides in the corner, okay? And for the record, I do think pits are very, very cute. I think they're one of the cutest little dogs. I think their heads are really big. And I think that's part of the cutest thing about them. Would I ever personally own a pit? Nah, because I'm a little scared of you because so many of them just turn. A lot of people say that's a nurture issue. They weren't raised right. Family didn't treat them right. Listen, all I know is that for whatever reason, sometimes the dogs turn. And that's how a lot of men become as they're coming up in this culture and society. They are the sweetest things. And then for whatever reason, they just turn one day. So prior to the turn, if it is a nurture issue, then what we have to do is prevent them from turning, basically, because once they turn, that's it. Chat says mainstream media has rotted the brains of society. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're trying to prevent the turn. The rest of them, they're, they've already turned. It's too late, like zombies, I think I said. Yeah, they turn into zombies. They turn like zombies is what the chat says. Absolutely. So we're trying to either prevent them from turning. Well, there's no either. We're trying to prevent them from turning, basically, into zombies, zombified bots, empty, soulless vessels who only listen to the voice of dead influencers like Kevin Samuels. And that's it. It's so sad. It's sad to see because there's really no bringing them back. They're for the streets after that. Okay. So now what time are we sitting at? How much time? We've been here for an hour and 36 minutes. And I want to, I want to open up the lines really quick. I don't think we'll have anyone call in. What I'm looking for specifically are people who disagree, but I haven't seen any of them in the chat. They might be just listening. What I'm looking for are people who disagree. So if you actually agree with me, I'm going to ask you not to call in tonight, but we'll, we'll do that another night. Okay. So let me see if I can run a quick graphic. This is going to be really, really, really bootleg, but I want to be able to display the questions on the screen. So welcome everybody. I'm going to open up the phones, not really phones, but you know, whatever, temporarily to see if anybody wants to talk about this or disagree with me on this issue. And I'm going to actually display the questions that you have to answer before, before I'll hear you out, before I'll actually hear your argument. Okay. So again, this little graphic is going to be super bootleg, but I'm just making it on the fly because I think this is important. I think it's very important for the conversation. And I also really just want to know. All right. So boom, downloaded that. Let me get this up here really quick and welcome everyone. Add overlay. Let's get this displayed so we can stay focused in our conversation. Welcome everyone to the chat. Great to have you. Happy Father's Day to the good fathers out there. To those of you who actually are good fathers and are doing the right thing and not psychopathic. Thank you. We need you. We appreciate you. Now, how do I do this? I have not done this in so long. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. I think I have to click this. Ah, here we go. All right, copy. Okay, so again, please only dial in if you disagree, but you have to answer these questions first. The questions are define father in the home, define the absence of a father. You have to tell me what we should do with all the people who grew up without one. You have to tell me how we prevent fatherless homes. 
And you have to tell me how quickly should a wife or a woman replace the man if he dies or leaves. All right. So I'm not going to leave this up forever. Here comes the link. You do not have to come on camera. And again, I doubt that we'll have any, any takers, but we, oops. Oh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you for the super sticker. I appreciate you so much. Daniel is a good supporter of the channel, big supporter of the channel. And I appreciate you greatly, Daniel. I really, really do. Thank you. All right. So boom. So there's the link. And we'll wait and see if anyone bites. In the meantime, I'm going to scroll through some of your comments. And then we'll get out of there. Out of there. We'll get out of here. Okay. So there is the link. Let me see here. I'm going to set a timer. And if we have no takers, we'll just we'll just leave. We'll just get out of here. All right. So I'm going to set a timer for 15 minutes. I'm surprised they're not here. They're usually right on time. This one says, PTE, what a fantastic topic. My father was a narcissist and in my life, I avoided him as much as I could. I married and divorced a psychopath. He was calm and confident, never explosive or critical. Mm, that's pretty deep. This one says, great topic. My father is a narcissistic pastor in the home, but very abusive. Mm -hmm. That happens a lot. A lot. Let's see. Someone giving me some good content for a deeper PTE. This one says, our fathers set the stage for the men we will attract. Absolutely. Absolutely. So often when you hear this group arguing about different things, they'll say things like, well, she ain't got no daddy. Well, sometimes she does have a daddy, but he set the stage for the types of men that she was attracted to, unfortunately. Or more than that, he sets the stage for what she believes to be normal. So if he displayed very abnormal traits and characteristics, she's going to be she's going to be attracted to or consider normal, very abnormal things. And it won't be until she gets older that she realizes, wow, that wasn't normal at all or healthy. This one says, my father was my stepfather, my biological father. I never got to know, and he does not contact me even now. So I will probably never get to know him. I'm sorry to hear that. I am sorry to hear that. Oh, we got 110 votes on our poll. It says, was your father in your life? 57% said yes. 43% said no. So thank you to everyone who voted in the poll. Looks like the majority of you had your father in your life. I didn't include an, an other option. I almost put an option on there that said it's complicated. But I decided not to do that. So thank you to everyone who voted. Let's see here. Just going through your comments and seeing if we have any takers for anyone who disagrees. If you disagree, you got to answer these questions first and then we can talk. All right. Let's see. This one said, my dad is awesome. He's always been a great teacher, even though I wasn't raised in the same house as him. He's a big part of why I'm not for the bullshit. Absolutely. Oh, and I just realized I failed to answer whether or not my father was in my life. My father was in my life from birth. Oh, but my story is so complicated, you guys. My story is complicated. I have been hesitating on doing a show, really discussing both of my parents, something that I will be putting behind a paywall. So if I ever do do that show... It'll be a members only show. I do not have memberships turned on right now, but if I ever decide to do that show, it will be behind a members only paywall just because I don't want my business all out in the streets. YouTube is a public platform. And even though members could do the same thing, like at least you paid for it. You know what I mean? Like if you want to sabotage me, at least you did it. You paid to do it. You know what I'm saying? But I hesitate so much. My, my story is so complicated, you guys. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. This one says, my dad was a single father. My mother walked out when I wasn't even a year old. See, we rarely talk about that. We need to talk about motherless homes as well. Like, So it's like, 
it's like the mother doesn't factor in anywhere in this equation. Like to them, only the father is the one who impacts the child's upbringing, okay? In, the, in their eyes, all right? Going through your comments, see if we have any takers. This one says, I answered the poll. Yes, my father was in my life, but was it worthwhile? That's the question. Mm -hmm. That is the question. Because imagine if your dad is like one of these manosphere bros. Oh my God. Can you imagine what a nightmare situation that would be? If your mother somehow ends up with a manosphere bro, and you're raised by a man with manosphere characteristics and ideologies. You're going to be just as screwed up as a kid who had no daddy at all. And you know what's interesting? Now, this is just my observation. I don't know any statistics on this, but I promise you the children of single mothers. Sure. Yeah. OK, fine. You see some that grow up with some issues, but they seem to achieve more than kids who came from two parent households. I've seen more doctors who, you know, when they tell their story, they'll be like, my mom was a single mom and, you know, she did everything for us and she made sure education came first. And now I'm a doctor or I'm a dentist or I'm a lawyer or I'm this or I'm that. You know what I mean? So it's almost like the struggle helped produce a stronger person versus someone who really didn't have to struggle that much produces, I wouldn't say a weaker person, but I would say a person who is not quite as hungry for success because they never really felt struggle like that. That's just my opinion, though. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling your comments. No takers so far. I don't expect any, though, because <laughs> I never do this. So I don't expect there to be anybody or maybe they just don't want to answer these questions. Let's see here. This one says, I can't answer your poll question. My dad was there, but my mom did most of the heavy lifting and still does. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't tell you how many women I've heard say, like, if they have two children, real children, and they're married, they'll say, I have three kids. My two children and my husband, I have three kids. This one says Brad Sellers, who's a former NBA player, left his wife when she got MS, said he couldn't handle that. He's now a mayor in Warrensville, HTS. Is that Heights? Warrensville Heights? What's HTS? Did he have kids? Did he leave the kids behind? This one says they give the man too much credit, if you ask me, that his presence makes things better when sometimes it doesn't. Like, how many stories have you heard? Uh, basically, the mom and kids are happy until dad comes home and then everyone clams up and they get quiet and they go to their rooms or whatever. Like he frosts the place out. And again, not to say that mothers can't do that as well, but we got to stop acting like the simple presence of a man makes all of life better. If that was the case, I think our world would look way different. I think, I do think we have a big problem with a lot of men. Like something has misguided them. Something led them astray. Now what that something was, I can't, can't really tell you, but something led them astray. And I honestly think it's this belief that I must dominate. I must be in charge. Everyone has to listen to me. Like this he-man type thing. Like we, we're not training them to be humans. We're training them to be monsters in a way. And guess who's doing the primary training of that? Other men. Like you think these manos manosphere idiots would be trying to lead these men to a higher calling, but often they lead these men to degeneracy. These are the same men who will turn around and complain about fathers not being in the home, but then turn around and encourage men to fly overseas to sleep with cheap prostitutes. Well, how is that family building? That's not building a family. Flying overseas to sleep with cheap prostitutes. How's that building the American family? It's not. 
You're opening him, opening him up to disease. You're encouraging him to take care or take care, excuse me, take advantage of women who are typically living in abject poverty and they have to sell their bodies to survive. You know what I mean? So how is that making him a better man? Like, it's just so pathetic. It's sad. Uh, this one says, thank you for coming out against this simplistic narrative. A father is not a cure for every ailment. It's silly. It really is. It really is. Like, is it helpful when the man is educated and wise and stable? I won't even say educated, intelligent, wise, stable, compassionate, caring, protective, loving, nurturing, loyal. Absolutely. But those, I believe, are traits of a great human being. You know what I mean? But it's not the case a lot of times. A lot of times when he got put out the house, he needed to be put out the house. I hate to say that, but it's true. Because here's the other assumption they make. I forgot to put this on there. They assume that women don't want the father of their children around their children. Like, are you psychotic or, or are you stupid or, or both? Like most girls, most heterosexual girls grow up daydreaming about their wedding and daydreaming about the children that they'll have with the man that they love. Some girls, we used to do this thing called MASH, which stood for mansion, apartment, shack, or house. And then I forgot how you did MASH, but you had to take like the letters in your name and the letters of his name. And I forgot how MASH worked. <laughs> But eventually, when you got through working the little formula, it would tell you if you were going to end up in a mansion, an apartment, a shack, or a house with this man. Like we used to sit there and do mash in our notebooks regarding the boys that we liked. We would sit there and name our children in advance before we even talked to the boy. We'd be naming our kids' children's our kids' names. But we don't want you in the house. You're slow. Something's wrong with you. Like we daydream about this stuff. Like that's what we used to dream about marrying you guys and having families with you. But guess what? Early on, the narrative was, oh, well, don't tell a guy that you like him or don't let him know that you like him too much because that'll turn him off. So a lot of women learned how to pull back. We learned how to pull back from expressing our feelings towards a man because we were told that if, if you show him that you like him, he'll get scared and he'll pull back from you. These are facts. If any ladies in the chat know what I'm talking about, please back me up. These are facts. They used to tell us, don't, don't tell him that you like him and definitely don't tell him that you want a relationship because that'll scare him off. So we learned to kind of conceal it a little bit because we didn't want to scare you off. Now you're complaining that the nuclear family is falling apart. Something's wrong with you. You don't deserve families because you are the one who destroyed it. You really are. Mm. Chat says both parents are expected to or need to work. And that is the real problem. Absolutely. Our economy is the problem. Rent so high, mortgages so high that both parents have to be gone all the time. Neither one of them can truly afford to be there unless one of the other is rich. Mm, chat says, my mom has bankrolled my dad's many failed business ventures for years. He refuses to get a real job. Oh, but this group would say, but he's in the house, though. You got your father in the home. Your fa father's in the home, though. It's like, yeah, but my mom has bankrolled many of his failed business ventures. Yeah, but he's in the home. <laughs> that is not the marker of success, you guys. Presence does not equal productivity. This chat says some emotionally abandon their families. Silent treatment, overwork, and busy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like a lot of parents don't even know their children. They don't know them at all. Like if they had to take a quiz on like who their child is or what their child likes. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Got a cash out from Lisa. I appreciate it so much. Thank you so much. I will go accept that here momentarily. Appreciate you very much. Yeah, like <laughs> chat says, oh my God, it's true. Oblivious people let problems go on for decades before addressing them. 
It only comes after an inevitable explosion. Absolutely. Then they want to talk about what caused the explosion. Well, the gasoline and the fire. Yeah, but, you know, the gasoline needs to be in the house. Okay. All right. This one says, my sperm donor dumped me off like a garbage bag at my grandparents' house. After a 45-minute drive from the new life he started, he did this when I was 11 years old. So sad. I think that's the saddest part. I think that's another part that they're missing with this argument. It's not the absence of the father. It's the emotional abandonment. Because let's let's play devil's advocate here. Let's say I was a man and let's say I just didn't want to be with the mother of my children anymore. So I left. I moved out. Right. And let's say she was let's just say what they always say, that she was angry. The relationship ended. So she kept me away from the kids. So let's let's play devil's advocate and pretend that the mother of my children was keeping me away from my children. OK. All right. But before I give you that scenario, my 15 minutes is up. So I am going to go ahead and close. I'm going to close the call in. I didn't think anybody would. <laughs> I didn't think anybody would, but I wanted to open it up just in case. Okay. So we'll try that again another day. Um, so let's say that the mother of my children was legit keeping me away from my children. Right. And she won't let me call them. I call, she hangs up on me. She changes her phone number. Let's even say she moves away. And let's just say, I don't feel like going through the courts to see my kids. Right. Which, I mean, you should theoretically, but let's just say, I don't feel like it. There's nothing that would stop me from buying a gift every birthday and keeping it like in the closet and just writing the year on it. 20, we'll just start in the year 2015, 2015 gift 2016 gift oh, baby it's me it's me it's me that was mama that was mama i was pretending to write it's okay mommy it's okay she does not like scratching sounds so i was pretending to write on my <laughs> i was pretending to write on my um desk and she heard it and it just it's okay mama chill out it's all right it's all right but let me double check let me just check these cameras real quick make sure i'm not whoa what was that Oh, it's a little dog. Oh my God. There's too much going on right now. Okay. Anyway, too much going, too much going on over here. Anyway, it's okay, mom. It's all good. Okay. There's nothing that would stop me. <laughs> Poor baby. She's so stressed. From writing, like buying a gift every year for my child, writing the year on the package and just putting it in a closet somewhere. So in the event, me and this child reconnect someday. I'd be like, listen, your mother really did keep me away from you. She would not let me talk to you. She wouldn't let me see you. But I never stopped thinking about you. And here's 18 years worth of gifts. And I would literally hand them all 18 years worth of gifts at once with the years written on every box. Cards, buying a birthday card, signing it, putting the year in that, sealing it. So my kid would know that just because your mother kept me away from you, does not mean I stopped thinking about you. It doesn't mean that I stopped loving you or caring about you. Like if my kid had like tuition or something, I found out they were going to some college. I would be trying to reach out to that college, paying their tuition behind the scenes. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to withdraw yourself completely and just fold your hands up, put them in your pockets and kick a little rock down the street. Like, oh man, man, she won't let me see my kid. So you know, I'm not going to, so I'm not going to do anything then. She won't let me see my child. So I'm going to do absolutely nothing. Like that's insane to me. That's crazy. Nothing would have prevented me from at least doing what I could behind the scenes and then trying to reconnect with my child when they became an adult and giving them 18 years worth of presence. I see that a, um, a super chat came in. Let me see. Let me check my phone really quick. See if I can find it. Uh oh, thank you so much from Cheated No More. I appreciate it. It says, thank you, important content. I appreciate you so much. Thank you for your support. I really, really appreciate that. All right. So we'll just do a few more comments, then I'll close this out. We'll get out of here. I appreciate you guys so much for being here. And again, yes, I support two-parent households. Yes, I think that that would be ideal. I think that would be wonderful. If everyone could grow up with both parents and have both of those parents be healthy, 
stable, normal, supportive, loving, and all of that. I think that would be wonderful. However, I dwell in reality. And I also recognize who the actual problem really, really is. And that's not to say that women don't do anything wrong and that women don't contribute to the downfall of the family sometimes. But as a woman, I can tell you, no woman really wants their family to fall apart. That's insane. The only thing that we dream about as women when we're younger, heterosexual women anyway, is getting married. Well, not all, all heterosexual women don't dream about getting married. But my point is, those of us who, who thought we would or wanted to be married, we, we dream about that. We dream about that day. We dream about him. Usually when we're in love with a man, we're freaking obsessed with him. Like we have to hide it. Our friends get sick of us because we talk about him all the time. So the fact that you think that we wouldn't want our family, the fact that you think that we wouldn't want the father in the home shows me how insane you are. And it also shows me how much you don't really know women or understand women. You don't. Because if you did, you would know that that's literally all we're really going for. We want that. But a lot of women will not allow themselves to be mistreated or abused. They will not allow their children to be mistreated or abused. And I feel like that's what y'all really get mad at. The fact that we don't let you do whatever. That we set boundaries that we set rules, that we have expectations. And if you continuously fail, yes, she might eventually leave you or break up with you because she has to protect her children. Don't ever discount the motherly instinct. They want us to give up our motherly instinct, just like the now deceased Kevin Samuels did. Do you remember that? When we did that video and we reviewed how he asked the woman, and what if your daughter came to you and told you this and that about me? And she was like, oh, the relationship will be over. He was like, no, no. See, that's where you're wrong. That's where you're wrong. Okay, well, the relationship's over. You got to get out. He was trying to get her to discount her motherly instincts, which is probably why he's no longer with us today. But I digress. They want us to abandon our protective instinct. And anytime someone starts to present themselves as some sort of threat, you can expect the woman to withdraw. It's natural. So stop trying to override our natural protective instincts, but imagine how much it takes for it to finally get to that point, for it to finally get there, for her to decide, you know what? We would be better off outside of this relationship than inside of it. It takes a lot. Like there's a lot of you who know women who you wish she would leave that relationship. You wish she would leave. It would be better for her and for her kids but she keeps going back. You see what I mean? We don't give up that easy. We really don't. So for us to finally reach the end of our rope, you really did a lot, sir. You've done a lot. Probably don't need to be around anybody's child. All right. <laughs> so with that, let me see if I can find a good one to close on. They're all good. You guys know that, but I like to close on one that's really profound and have you guys thinking thinking as we head out, out here. All right. This one says, so true, PTE. My children's father was in the home, but always in his man cave or would leave to hang out with his friends. Exactly. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. They do go hang out with their friends a lot. Oh, how sad. This one says, my dad would disappear to his study after work. However, it was neat as a pen in there. He didn't play with us as children, though. I had to win his attention. Mm. God, how sad. How sad. This one says, so I left my ex because he mentally, emotionally abandoned the family, but it's been flipped and I'm the one to blame for the abandonment. My children were older because of his narcissism. I think I flip, I think I read that wrong. I flip-flopped that one. Mm. Just trying to find one more that we could close on. I think this is good. It says, narcissists are filled with devils that torment their mind. We act on what we think about. Renew your mind with God's truth about you. Romans 12 verses one and two. I think that's I think that's a good one to close on. 
I think the men that we're discussing tonight, the men who <laughs> run around screaming fathers in the home, fathers in the home, fathers in the home all the time, their minds are tormented and filled with little devils who lie to them essentially. And I hope that I broke down and broke apart some of those lies this evening. I hope I gave you something to think about. And for those who do run around screaming father in the home, father in the home, I hope I've added some nuance to your conversation, to your discussion. And I hope that I've helped you think through this a little bit more. It's not quite as simple as, yeah, okay, a woman is going to go through all that. Marrying a guy, having his baby just to kick him out of the house, that's insane. That's insane. But like I said earlier, it also shows me that you don't know women at all. You don't know our heart. You don't know our mind nor our intentions, okay, or what we're really about. So with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and close the show. It's been great to have you all. And I cannot wait to read your comments. For those of you who are watching the playback, please do leave comments. Let me know what you think about this topic. And if the conversation gets going strong enough, we will do another show on this topic. And as always, I will be playing it back to watch and read all the comments in the live chat because it is one of my favorite things to do. OK, so with that, enjoy the rest of your evening. Happy Sunday. Happy Father's Day. Happy Juneteenth. Happy to all the happies. Thank you to everyone who supports the channel. And we will talk again very, very, very soon. OK, bye.